This is Focus in Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. It's everywhere, but is it clean enough for, to breathe in? We look at the impact of air pollution on our health and new attempts to monitor it. Black smoke that normally comes out, that is the worst thing. When you breathe those particles, it's so painful. A president walking against corruption will go to Kampala for more. Also in the program, meeting the Adebanjos, we speak to the cast of the British Nigerian sitcom that was rejected many times by traditional broadcasters. At the beginning of this year, if you had asked me, would we on Netflix come November, I would have said no, no chance. And in sports, uh, it could be a history-making game today for Egyptian star Mohamed Salah if he features for Liverpool as they host Everton. Find out why. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. We start today with a special report on what's been dubbed a silent killer, one of the world's largest health and environmental problems. The World Health Organization estimates that air pollution kills 7 million people a year worldwide, with over 1 million of those deaths occurring in Africa. Now, people in low and middle income countries suffer most from exposure, and women, children, and those who work outdoors are most at risk. Now, in Nairobi, scientists have developed a low-cost air pollution sensor that allows citizens to monitor the air quality in their community. Now, with new funding, their ambition is to install over 3,000 across the continent. Now, they hope people will use them to fight for their right to clean air. Solomon Serwanja, the BBC's 2019 Komla Dumo Award winner, reports from Nairobi. Tina and her one-year-old daughter Clarissa live next to a steel mill in Mukuru, a pollution hotspot on the edge of Nairobi. The white powdery ash from the mill has to be washed away every day. The particles and some other sm black smoke that normally comes out, that is the worst thing. When you breathe those particles, it's so painful. At this local clinic, the number of cases of pneumonia, asthma and chest infections has doubled in the last 12 months. The World Health Organization recognizes air pollution as one of the causes. Cecilia can hardly breathe and Borita's lung capacity is not what it should be. There are nearly three quarters of a million people living in this community and many of them are struggling to breathe because of the air quality. There's a team of African scientists who have come up with ways of measuring the air quality here and they think that it is a step forward in finding a solution to this problem. These low-cost air pollution sensors are easy to install. They detect and record the amount of dangerous small particles in the air. That data is then transmitted to a website where it can be accessed by anyone for free. Our data is accurate, which means anyone in any city across any African country will be able to use it, deploy it, and get real-time local data for their neighborhoods that they can use to petition governments to solve problems that they face around air pollution. That is what the community living next to this asphalt factory did after they started having breathing problems. They installed sensors in their homes. Our campaign got the attention of, um, of the media and uh, the government agencies that were ignoring us before. The director of the environment agency came over and instructed the, um, the factory to shut down and, and only open after they um, complied with, the, with their laws. Another part of town Rashida and Nazil, who like Tina, live next to a steel mill, are still mourning their two-year-old daughter who died in April. The cause of death was a respiratory disease that the doctors said could be caused by air pollution. Now, they are worried about their surviving son. Look at all these inhalers. I have to use this. The doctors are wondering. You know, this is too much for him. He's only six years old. He's coughing. When he coughs, he coughs for a whole full week. 
Nazir believes that the data from the sensors in his community will help his campaign for clean air. Data will not lie. Sensors will not lie. It's very clear. All you need to do is use that and you'll get the answers you need. That's all we need. The hope is that this technology will empower communities like Tina and Clarissa's to fight for their right to clean air. <coughs> Solomon Serwanja, BBC News, Hola. Nairobi. Well, Solomon is with me now in studio. Thanks for taking time to talk to us, Solomon. I mean, the statistics by WHO are quite alarming, but we're not just talking about um, outdoor pollution, are we? I think air pollution, Sophie, is one of the biggest problems that Africa is facing. UNICEF said that in 2016 alone, about 500,000 babies died because of air pollution-related causes, which is quite disturbing. And breaking it down, we are looking at two types. We have the outdoor pollution, Sophie, which of course is caused by the heavy fumes that come out of the traffic from the roads and old vehicles which are on many of the streets on African continent. But we're also looking at burning plastics, Sophie. I was in Nairobi and I just saw people just burning plastics. It's heavy fumes, clearly dark fumes going up into the air. When power goes off, generators all start and they release that heavy fume. So it's a whole cocktail mix of uh, different, you know, you know, bad fumes coming mm. from different places. So outdoor pollution is one of it, but also indoor pollution. So right, right, Solomon, we're looking at a continent that's fast industrializing and urbanizing. Um, are there governments that have policies, say, to regulate uh, air pollution, for instance? Well, Kenya is doing well, first of all. They banned all cars which are eight years older, and which is good because the old vehicles actually emit more emissions. Uh, Kenya is also, uh, has done something amazing by uh, reducing the amount of sulfur in the diesel that is imported into the country from 1,000 parts per million mm -hmm. to about 500 parts per million, which reduces the amount of sulfur that goes into the air. Uganda in itself has done an amazing job by, uh, they have also put up very, very strong regulations in the cars that are entering into the country. But I think among all of these, West African countries have done absolutely well because mm -hmm. they have banned the importation of uh, dirty diesel. I think it's, it's, it's a catch-22 here because you're looking at, so what do we do if you've banned this diesel? Because we have to keep moving. Are we, should we adopt the electric cars, Sophie? What happens to the oil industry? Now, you've been here for a few months, Solomon. And when I first talked to you, when you came here to London to you know, get a bit of training, I asked you what you wanted to take away with you. What have you taken away with you? Well, first of all, Sophie, three months have been an amazing time being with the team here. But I think what I take away from here is, you know, three things for me. The mastery of time, very important here. If a program is one minute, it should be one minute. If it's, if it's 52 seconds, it is not 53 seconds, it's 52, <laughs> or otherwise they fade you out. Uh, so time is very important. In just Three seconds, you have to be able to get the audience of the viewer for the, for the digital desk. And so your audience is very important. But also, Sophie, the second thing that I take away from this, in my own view, is the simplicity behind the complexity. I think what happens is the BBC gets the news, the complex news, and makes it so simple for the audience to understand using short sentences, using case studies that drive you into the story. And I think I'm carrying that art with me back home. But also the third thing, the last thing, I find the team here at the BBC very open. You know, you're working with editors who have experiences of about 20 years plus, but they're able to listen from you, not only them telling you, but they're able to listen from you. They are learning from you, you're learning from right. them. And so it's a whole, it has been a great experience for me. Sophie. All right, Solomon, all the best. Go and shine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All Sophie. the best. All right. Now, the World Climate Conference has been talking about related issues today. Let's go straight to Madrid because the BBC's Pierre Antoine Denis is there. What have they been saying about air pollution there? Well, obviously, Sophie, as you can imagine, the air pollution topic is at the forefront of the whole debate here for the for the past three days and it will be for the next 10 days or so because 
uh, obviously it is a major threat to, to our climate and in the next 10 or 15 years if nothing is done cities across Asia but also across Africa cities like Lagos, Cairo or Nairobi as we've just seen who might explode in terms of carbon dioxide in, in terms of their emissions so we know here and the officials I've, I've talked to we all know that there is an important task ahead for, for mayors and also for policy makers in the way that we must uh, implement greener policies, we must implement greener transportation in order to make sure that the amount of carbon emissions in the big cities across Africa and across the whole world do not uh, exceed a certain amount so that we can respect the global goal across the world to never go up the two uh, degrees Celsius that has been signed in Paris in 2015. All right, Pierre-Antoine Denis there for us in Madrid. Thank you. Now, picture this, a president taking to the streets in protest against corruption. That's what happened in Uganda on Wednesday when President Yoweri Museveni led crowds in a four-kilometer walk in the capital Kampala. And he says he knows the country's corrupt officials but just needs to gather evidence in order for them to be prosecuted. Catherine Biaruhanga has more. That's President Yoweri Museveni dressed in a white safari hat and carrying a traditional walking stick. In recent months, there's been speculation about his health and rapid weight loss. This was also his opportunity to show he's fit and healthy and to convince Ugandans that he's ready to fight bribery. He came with a strong message for his allies in government. I know many of you who, who, are, who, are, who are corrupt. So if you think, if you see that I've not arrested you, don't think that you are safe. I'm just waiting for enough evidence. His message was received here, but will it resonate beyond this carefully organized state event? President Chair Museveni is just yeah, about to run for a sixth term in office. He needs to show Ugandans that he has fresh ideas on. on how to fight corruption and provide better services. Uganda has been ranked as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Millions of dollars have been stolen from the health budget, reconstruction efforts for war-affected districts, and aid for refugees. Away from the bubble of the march, there was traffic gridlock because of diversions. Although a workday, there was no public transport into the city, and many had to walk. While the president marched, on the outskirts of town, his longtime rival, Kiza Vesige, was blocked from holding a parallel demonstration. The police stopped him as they said he was trying to cause chaos in the city. They towed him home in his car. Very cool, huh? Is Some that, activists uh, argue the president also, is not committed to rooting out corruption because it would weaken his hold on power. Podium. This corruption has gone so deep that it has turned out as a, what feeds the patronage system that runs this regime. And people are seeing it, is uh, not tackling it, because it is at the center of re regime survival. He needs to prove us wrong. The president is promising action, and many would be excited to see some results, though remain unsure about his commitment to rooting out corruption. Hunger joins me now from Kampala. Catherine, this is quite unexpected, really, a fast to my knowledge. A president marching against corruption in his own country. What was the thinking behind this? Well, think about the images that Ugandans and people around the world are going to be seeing today. They're going to be seeing President Museveni energetic, walking around Kampala, healthy and fit and proposing some solutions. So I think this is one way for him to show that he is staying in touch with the public and also show Ugandans that he is a leader not only of the past, of the last three decades, but somebody who can lead the country going forward. And just think about it, in just over a year, there's going to be a hotly contested election in this country. He's going to face Bobby Wine and Kiza Besije likely at the next ballot. So he's really upped his game already ahead of these elections. So it's a mixture of a lot of things. And how huge is, is the problem of corruption in Uganda, Catherine? Well, the data that we have from the anti-corruption court is that they say in cases that they've actually been able to prosecute, they've asked for $19 million to be returned to the public coffers. 
but they say of this money only a quarter of a million has actually been paid back and this really illustrates the problem Many people believe that there is rampant corruption in Uganda. If you look at the health ministry, um, if you look at the aid budget for refugees as well, there have been allegations of corruption there. The question is whether there's been adequate pr prosecution of individuals who have found themselves to have been accused of corruption. Mm. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Catherine, about how independent the judicial system in Uganda is. Well, there was recently um, a report that was published about the judiciary from an organization called SIPL um, in 2016, and they highlighted some key issues. They talked about the breakdown of the rule of law in Uganda, and there they pointed the finger at the executive, the president, and they said there was an overbearing on the judiciary in order for it to carry out its work. But there are strong criticisms from everyday Ugandans who say that there is a lot of corruption within the courts and they usually have to pay money for justice. Catherine Biaruhanga for us there in Kampala. Thank you. Let's take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa and staying with Uganda. Dozens of people are feared to have been killed in a landslide in the east of the country. Local authorities in the Bududa district say at least 20 houses were buried. Six have been confirmed dead, but almost 50 are still missing. Zimbabwe's government says about 46 doctors have returned to work following a weekend moratorium given to those fired for striking. Hundreds more refused to take up the offer, which expired on Sunday. Doctors have been on strike for over three months to press for wage increases in the wake of an economic crisis. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, Mimi with the sport in cricket. South Africa's Mickey Arthur is set for a new post. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport now. Mimi. Thank you very much, Sophie. It was a big night for two Ghanaian stars on Tuesday in the English Premier League and none other than for this man, Jeffrey Schlupp, who grabbed all the headlines as he scored the winner for Crystal Palace as they beat Bournemouth 1-0 with just under 15 minutes remaining. There were also 10 men down in the game, but the win now makes Roy Hudson side to fifth in the Premier League. Ghana's Jordan Ayew got man of the match and there was high praise too for Senegal international Sheku Kuyate who got lots of compliments from his manager. Togo legend Emmanuel Adebayo says he's considering his future after quitting Turkish top-tier strugglers Kayseri Sarspor. The 35-year-old joined the club in August following a spell with rivals Istanbul Basak Shahir. Adebayo admits he does not have any new club lined up for the time being as hopes to sort out his future but has not ruled out a return to Turkey. Now staying with football, there are six more matches that will be kicking off in just over an hour's time. Tonight sees Liverpool host Everton, but it could be a special history-making night for this man, Mohamed Salah. If he features, he will become the second Egyptian to make 100 Premier League appearances, emulating Ahmed El Mohamedi. And Jose Mourinho will return to Old Trafford as his side Tottenham Hotspur face his former club Manchester United. It's almost a year since he was sacked by the club, but he will be making an appearance with a side that has had three wins from three since he took over from Maurizio Pochettino in November. Like uh, a little bit like Mr. Mandela was, was saying sometime, you never lose, you win or you learn. And... Uh, at United, I won and I learned. And uh, my time after I left was, was, a good time, was a good time for me. So it's not for me to analyze United now. Now I analyze United as a team, as an opponent. And South African Mickey Arthur is set to be named as Sri Lanka's head cricket coach ahead of a two-match test series against Pakistan later this month. Elsewhere, where the Court of Arbitration for Sport has confirmed the suspension imposed on the Egyptian Weightlifting Federation. That's all the sports, Sophie. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Now, our next story just goes to show how hard work, perseverance and patience pays off. 
Even in the face of rejection and adversity, Meet the Adebanjos is a, a British Nigerian sitcom about a Nigerian couple trying to bring up their British born children in South London. Now, the show was rejected many times by traditional broadcasters. They've now been snapped up by international streaming service Netflix. My colleague Peter Okwoche spoke to the executive producer Andrew Opeyemi and the actress Yetunde Oduole. At the beginning of this year, if you had asked me, would we on Netflix come November, I would have said no, no chance. Because, you know, everyone had given up, the cast, the crew, everyone had moved on doing other things. And we were just happy that, you know, the show had, had um, aired across the world and we were satisfied. But um, I think it was in February, I got a notification on my LinkedIn that someone I'd met through my travels across Africa had just joined Netflix. And, um, you know, like, you know, we just feel like that, 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 that anticipation that maybe, maybe something could happen. And then I reached out and then through going back and forth, that's how it ended up at Netflix. That's just in about two minutes, but it, it was a long process. And before that, so many disappointments. Why was it so difficult for you to get onto mainstream TV in this country, for instance? Yeah, I think it was before, I mean, it's almost because it was too authentic, you know, so it wasn't watered down. So it, would, it was depicting what you would see in a traditional African family household. And the conversations we had with the commissioners, they said that it was great, they laughed, they enjoyed it, but it was too, it was too African, that like, could you water it down? And um, that's probably why it didn't um, get that You say that, I mean, but here in this country, there's a program on TV called Citizen Can. Yeah, I'm, you I'm, that's know, what exactly. I'm you know, well. and it's it's about for those of our viewers who don't know it, it's about a Pakistani family, you know, who've relocated to the UK, but the father is still very traditional in his own ways. I mean, it's something like that. I mean, yet and <laughs> can't you make any comparisons between the two? I that's, for me, I was thinking to myself when originally we were going through this whole stress. It's like what. What do you mean it's not it's too authentic what what else do you want this is how we are it made me think that what about desmond's they were doing a great show and it that's was another fantastic. sitcom and, you know, in the uk sitcom jamaican in the UK, this time. you know with you no know, west indian background i remember there was one they said oh um the actor sounded too authentic african can you not get a british actor to then mimic an african accent and that was like what do you mean you have to dress up uh, to represent your culture <laughs> exactly mum. Mm -hmm. that's why I'm going to wear the colours of the British flag. <laughs> Are you British? And I remember Andrew and Deborah, they worked really, really hard to even get myself and, and Wale. They went through even big names, bigger than I. I remember one of the big actors to come and audition. And they didn't feel as if they were great enough. So if they've done all the hard work already, what are you trying to say that what they've done is not good enough? So it was really quite daunting thinking, you know, that oh, it's too authentic. I mean, you know, now that Afrobeat has gone crazy, everybody's like, oh my goodness. And, and you know, it just brings me to the, I mean, the two kids when the, the series started, you know, where are I mean, they must have grown a bit now, a couple yeah. of years older. <laughs> so are you accommodating that in the new script? No, so it's the same. So like the series you see on Netflix is, is the original series, the original ones. Um, but the future seasons, we're actually traveling with, with the original cast. So you're going to see them now in new scenarios, new situations of them, you know, going to university, um, potentially maybe getting married. And then what does that involve for in an African household? So we just want to tell Who the stories. Who they marry as well? Who they, they marry English or, you know? you know, did they stick with the African values? Did they, you know, run off? Because you have to be authentic about it. You know, as Nigerians, as human beings, we love is love. You want to love whoever you want to. And I know that there's a lot of Nigerians, ah, you can't bring this kind of person to the house. Oh, my God. So those are, there's so many storylines, I think, there's there for the future. <laughs> Interesting discussion there. Let's take a quick look again at our main story on Focus on Africa. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni has led thousands of civil servants and supporters on an anti-corruption march through the capital Kampala, a rally that was immediately dismissed as a stunt by activists and the opposition. Uh, Mr Museveni said corrupt people were parasites because they did not earn their wealth. Activists countered that not a single minister in Mr. Museveni's government had been jailed despite numerous corruption scandals. That's Focus on Africa for now. Thanks for your company.